everybody. Good morning. I just I just told Mr. Ben Kiker this would have been such a good show ten days ago when I first got this domestic violence with me in the porch. <laughs> <laughs> would have been great if we'd have come in here and said he gave me my first lesson and busted my head. <laughs> that would have been so cool. Let's talk a little bit about your first lesson. When did you give your first lesson? How many years ago? Oh my goodness, that was about uh, 56 years ago. 56 uh, years ago. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah, um, back then karate was extremely rare. Uh, about the only places that were practicing karate during that time were in, like in New York where a lot mm -hmm. of the Oriental people had come over right. and in California. Uh -huh. And so like in Georgia, uh, You were we just, a rarity? Yeah, uh, uh, starting off, we were Joe Corley from Atlanta, uh, ran schools there, and, and we started opening up schools all around North Georgia. And when you, how old were you at that point in your life? Oh, uh, I was about 20, 21, I guess, okay. 20 or 21. Did you just see this on television and the movies and found an interest in it? How did you get involved in it? Well, how I got involved in it was everyone back then was really interested in karate, but we didn't have any knowledge about it usually. We mm -hmm. thought there was some little Oriental guy did his hand was like Elvis that. Was Elvis already doing it then? That's uh, what yeah. I was wondering. That's what I was, because Elvis was a big, big fan. Yeah, yeah he was. Uh, well, everybody was, yeah. you know, it's, uh, up through the 1980s is what I call the golden age of karate because everybody was interested in it. But uh, we had no chance to learn. There weren't instructors. Mm -hmm. And um, so what really got me started, I was at the University of Georgia, and uh, my girlfriend, uh, was taking karate at Reinhardt College. And she started telling me how good all these guys were and everything yeah. else like that. And I thought, you know, I, I can whip those guys. <laughs> um, I love it. I can, but, so uh, from the beginning you were competitive. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she invited me to a class and boom. Well, can we show, I think it's appropriate that now since she invited you to a class, top school of 40, is that not cool in 2012? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big honor. Top school for the last 40 years, Ben Kiker United Karate Studios. Now, how cool is that? And I told you, you know, my kids, when you're raising a bunch of kids and have a bunch of dogs and a husband and everybody's demanding your time, my kids came in and said, we want to take karate. And I said, huh, you're already doing basketball, football, cheerleading, uh, band corps, flag corps, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts. When are you going to do karate? And they told me when they were going to do it, and they did take karate, and they loved it. But the girls excelled in the period that you have seen in karate. Are women more into it than they ever were? Uh, yes, quite uh, uh, frankly, uh, women are generally more flexible than men. And so if they've got the stamina to continue in it, they can really benefit from it greatly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the men, you know, like the fighting a lot more, and uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of really good, good uh, competitors over the years. You want to talk about this gentleman right here? Uh, that's Travis Jones. Yes. He's from Blairsville, Georgia. Uh -huh. And uh, a very good full contact fighter. He has been... Uh, uh, an amateur world champion for four time, four different times. Wow, wow. How old is this gentleman right now? Uh, he's in his 40s now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. But his so son. So he's still a kid. <laughs> yeah, but his son is really excelling. Oh, uh, wow. Tyler, Tyler Jones, he's really excelling very well in, uh -huh. in kickboxing. Uh-huh. Now, at your age, because uh, you're like me, we probably should be retired and we're not. Are you still doing everything yourself? Are you still active? Yes, I'm active. I'm still teaching. I still train the full contact fighters and all like that. But, but that's one thing that we have failed probably to teach the public is that karate is a great exercise program for life, mm -hmm. not just when you're in your 20s or whatever like that. Back in uh, Asia, in Japan and in Korea, uh, 
oftentimes there was a room in their house that was designated as their dojo, their dojon, mm -hmm. and uh, their family would train there. And so they understood, you know, this is a great way to stay in shape all my life. So uh, my oldest student that is still active, very active, is Lamar Finley from here in LJ. Uh -huh. And he might be he's, over 60? He's 76. 76. Wow, mm -hmm. that is too cool. That is too cool. Yeah. And how often do you do classes? And what if somebody's sitting at home and they used to do karate and then they said, oh, I don't know anybody around here, just moved to the area. Do you still take new students or do you still, what are you open to? Do you have classes that have space? Oh, yes. Um, usually we set up a schedule for them for three times a week. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's not a real heavy commitment, but it is a commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, there's probably only about 1.3% of people in the United States that work out. And that's uh, something that uh, I hate to admit, you know, is, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm seeing all the time is every year the children are that much softer than they were the year before. Right. Wow. And um, so this well, is regimented funny. exercise. When you said flexibility, women are flexible because I don't know what you know about childbirth, but every bone in our body cracks, pops, jumps when we birth a baby. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So is that possibly why we are more flexible? Because think, we were designed to produce another life. I think God arranged it just perfectly. Yes, yeah, I think he did. Let's talk a little bit about God. And um, for new viewers who don't know the sad story of the loss of your daughter, how many years ago? 16, 16. years ago. I, th I thought it was about 16. Just Six, about four days ago. About four days ago, your precious daughter went to be with Jesus. And from that, you have spread the word of Jesus really worldwide. Well, we have uh, uh, two of my students, uh, Justin and Joyce Chadwick, started a foundation. And they called it, her name was Carrie. Mm -hmm. And so they, they called it Caring for Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have been involved <coughs> over there for ever, ever since her passing. And uh, we have been building churches and parsonages in her memory. Uh -huh. And uh, so right now we have either built or helped build 29 different churches and wow. parsonages. That's awesome. Yeah, That's the awesome. pastors over there can't afford a house or anything like mm -hmm. that so we try to build them a parsonage you know and that really does help uh -huh. absolutely now how often do you get to go there and visit i've i've been to africa six times mm -hmm. and uh so we are talking about going back to an, another time uh, maybe not before too long mm -hmm. and just check on things and uh we have uh, uh steve phil's mother and father started a ministry over there almost 70 years ago wow. and uh, so crazy. we have fed off that a lot mm -hmm. and it's helped us and we have a, a good man in charge over there pastor harrison who is an african mm -hmm. and uh, so we we're trying our best to help and reach the african people mm -hmm. i told you the story of my our she ended up being my kid's nanny and she was amazing she worked for me for many many years but she was in South Africa because her parents were missionaries. And this was 30 years ago. She started telling me these horrific stories about people being murdered because they attended church, murdered because they were spreading the word of God. Is that still happening in Africa? Yes, it is. People don't realize that and they don't think about it. But when we go over there uh, as our group, we never go out at night. Mm -hmm. Even though we feel fairly safe there, but... Uh, we just don't go out at night. We don't take any chances or anything like that. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, you have uh, uh, Islam is moving in to Kenya from Somalia a lot. And, uh, you know, like in Somalia, primarily, do they even have a government? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think so. Yeah. And, and, and the stories that she told us were not, I mean, it was almost unbelievable because it, it was torturous death. It was, it was horrible. I mean, and, and she would sit there and tell us, and we would just be mesmerized, like, how can this be going on in our world today? 
and to know that it's still going on. Um, what are we going to do? How are we going to stop it? If you have 29 churches there now, how many souls have come to know the Lord since you were involved? How many, how many times has your daughter been responsible for somebody finding <laughs> out about Jesus? Well, um, it's, um, it's really hard to say, you know, uh, we don't keep a head count or anything like that. There has been a really strong influence uh, because of caring for Kenya. And the way that uh, uh, turned out, uh, George Shadwick and Justin Shadwick had made our logo, and it's some flowers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, caring for Kenya there. And so when we went over there to our first church dedication, which was to Kerry, uh -huh. uh, the pastor, the African pastor who was preaching says, uh, uh, Carrie's flowers may have been in North Georgia. Yeah, North Georgia in America, but now her work and her flowers are over there. That's so, amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Well, I want to share something that I filmed yesterday at Ball Ground First Baptist Church. We have a young man who well. grew up in um, Ball Ground First Baptist Church. He was just a normal little Ball Ground boy who grew up hearing other preachers preach. And now he's preaching. But instead of staying in his comfort zone of Canton, Georgia with his family, he decided to go to New Orleans. Have you ever been to New Orleans? Never have. Pretty rough place. Pretty rough place. And so he chose to go to a very rough, rough area where they didn't know much about Jesus. And it was his mission to grow a small church and he's worked in it now this is eight years and uh, Justin Haynes is an amazing preacher and I want to share something with you I got so tickled because I always record his sermons and, and I listen to him over and over and over well yesterday's was about fasting and praying and karate is is truly about teaching and praying because you have to focus your mind to be able to do what you do Absolutely. It's not just your body, it's your mind too. And so when I was listening to Justin, I didn't eat breakfast before church, and I was sitting there thinking, well, today would be a good day to start fasting. But Ben Kiker, I went home and had spaghetti for lunch. But it fed some thought to me. And so I want you all to just listen to this little prayer. It's like two minutes long that Justin it's did as he opened the preaching. And uh, we're still loading it, but can we, while we're doing that, can we show the pictures of... I mean, All of it's still oh, it's still loading. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna share this with you because this young man kind of stepped out on faith, like a lot of people have, to go to foreign places, to go to places that are not safe, to go there and raise their children. They have six children. They've actually adopted two children from New Orleans, and and if y'all haven't been to New Orleans, <coughs> it is um, just a little rough. You know, have you ever heard of the red light district? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason they call it the Red Light District. And there's voodooism, there's Satan worshiping, there are neo-Nazis there. I mean, it's a very, very rough area. And the idea that this kid from Ball Ground, Georgia, chose, and I know his wife had to scratch her head and go, Justin, have you lost your mind? But they continue to grow. And it's like New Orleans certainly isn't Africa, and it's not that far away. But in faith, in faith. And what you have done in your daughter's memory was in faith. And now it's making a difference. Yes, it really is. As the churches grow over there and uh, the, the people have such needs because you know, there's no jobs hardly over there. Uh, th there's no way that they can, uh, like here we have an American dream, you know, we want to own our own home and mm -hmm. have a business or whatever. but. The opportunities just don't uh, reveal themselves over there. You know, one of the things I remember that Ms. Audrey taught was fresh water. There's so many places don't even have water. That is an extremely difficult thing over there. I remember one time I was going, we crossed over this little branch that would look like a sewer almost, and going to the church that we were going, which is about seven miles away. And so uh, we were talking about water there with one of the... Uh, one of the men there and he says you know that creek that you passed over and I said yes he says that's where I have to get water every day 14 miles 
Wow. Carrying wow. water. Wow. 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 It's and primitive. Yeah. Is is the area that you're in? Um, is it hot desert? What what's the what's it like? What's Kenya like? Well, it's not. Um, it, it's not like a jungle. Uh, they there's places in Kenya. The last time I heard, it hasn't rained in four years. Wow. And uh, wow. Yeah, that's it's it's that really really tough. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, in Caratina, where we're sort of uh, headed up there, it's a little bit higher and uh, in mount, a little bit mountainous, and it's a little cooler there, uh -huh. and they get rain sometimes, but still it's a real arid place. Okay, a loaded question. Why would people stay there? Why don't they flee there? Why, why did they stay? Because it's their culture and their homeland, and they don't, have an well, I'm sure that has something to do with it. But if you want to go to New York, you hop on a plane or you drive up there. They have no cars. Ben Cocker, I'm smarter than to go to New York. I've been one time. <laughs> <laughs> one time. And the traffic. I said, never. I don't care how good that pizza was. Never. Yeah. Mm. I might have a fly me a pizza. <laughs> yeah, they just Man. don't have the opportunity. Wow. And, uh, but they're... Uh, um, they're really a happy people. One thing I like, just love about the African people is their singing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it just, when you walk into one of their churches and they just love to sing. Wow. And they're happy at it. And uh, I, I don't know, it just sort of moves a crest away from your thinking or your uh -huh. heart or whatever. Because uh, they're happy. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, we've got Justin's prayer loaded, and y'all can all sit at home and laugh because the sermon was about fasting and praying, and yes, I pray every day, but fasting, I went home and ate spaghetti. But y'all listen and, and think about it because I've made a commitment. I'm not going to tell anybody because then when I fail at it, I will look like a failure. <laughs> but I've made a commitment now to myself just because this kid preached this message and said this little prayer. Here we go. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and I find comfort in knowing that <clears throat> rain is going to come and the winds and the storms of life are going to come our way. But when you are our firm foundation, we are safe with you. So, Lord, I pray this morning as we, in a little bit, get to the point of looking at your word on the topic that you placed on my heart, Lord, I pray that every Christian in this room would press in to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would take your Holy Spirit's finger And touch an area or areas of our lives this morning in a special and a powerful and a profound way. And I pray today if there's anybody in this room that would say that Christ is not my firm foundation. The reality of this life is that rain and storms and the wind is going to blow and toss us all around and we're going to have pain and heartache and all kinds of things like that. But I pray that if there's somebody in this room today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, would you open up the eyes of their heart and would you, whomever you might be, respond in faith today and experience the joy of salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, to see and hear all of Justin's preaching, I started loading it last night, and me and iCloud were not getting along too good last night. It was a little bit slow, and I was a little bit aggravated because I was sleepy. 
So I did put some on my Facebook page, but I loaded most of it on YouTube. So just go to Sherry Martin, Heart of the Home on YouTube, and you can see his message. It was a very powerful message. And I don't, I was thinking about Pastor Asa Dockery. I was with him. He did a 14-day fast. And toward the end, he was looking a little peaked. He was looking a little peaked. So I have made a commitment to myself, not to anybody else, to me and God, we're going to have this little talk. And I laughed about it because honestly I got home and couldn't wait to eat that leftover spaghetti so I you know I didn't do too good the first day but but we have to make a commitment and and as a Christian you made a commitment to make a difference in lives in honor and in memory of your beautiful daughter but then we are living in America where the churches are not full and the Sunday school classes Kids aren't in there like they used to be. We used to have such a crowded Sunday school class, you'd have to drag in a couple more chairs. That's not happening anymore. Ben, what's wrong? What are we doing wrong? Well, in my uh, opinion like this, you know, it's, uh, we have the shepherd who is our pastor, and then we have the sheep who we are. And uh, the shepherd, he is to equip the flock, mm -hmm. you know, and then... Sheep beget sheep, mm -hmm. but as sheep, we're not doing that. And that's the responsibility that falls on everyone's shoulder that's a member of the church. Yeah, absolutely. We leave it up to the pastor. Mm -hmm. Well, the pastor equips us, mm -hmm. then we're to go out. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Now, and, and you recommended somebody who's not sure... What if you woke up today and you saw the sunrise and you saw the beautiful trees and the blooming and the birds are coming back to sing and you don't believe in God? And you said to read John in the American Standard Version of the yeah, Bible? the book of John, you know, the book of John uh, uh, illustrates Jesus as God. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew portrays him as king. Uh, Mark portrays him as a, a servant. Luke portrays him as son of man, and the book of John uh, portrays him as God. Mm -hmm. And when, when you talk to somebody who says, you know, sometimes you invite people to church and they, oh, well, I go to my own church, or I don't go to church, I don't go to church, I don't go to church. And, um, okay, you don't have to go to church to believe in God. You can sit at home and read your Bible every single day. You can pray to God. You don't have to go to church. But a church family does help in hard times. And I've seen that a million times. A church family will gather around you and comfort you. I, I remember when my daughter died, Ebenezer Baptist Church here in LJ sent me a card signed by everybody. And what that meant to me, mm -hmm. what that meant to me, I still have that card. And I was like, you know, it, it just blew my mind because I knew that that church was praying for me. I knew they were. They still do that. Yes. Uh, I was sick about a year ago, and I got a card from Ebenezer Church with everybody signing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, and it, it lets you know that they are reaching out in God's name, you know, because they're gathering together, and they are praying for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Now... Tell me a little bit about this trophy. Well, that's some of the trophies that we give away at our tournaments. Uh -huh. um, it's a big boy. Yeah, that's a, that's a first place fighting or forms trophy there. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, our students win them whenever they win first place. Uh -huh. So it's a pretty good award. And now today, are people more competitive or do they just do it for exercise? Do you have somebody who just wants to nail it all and win everything? Do you have anybody doing that now? Oh, yeah. We have uh, uh, a lot of people that really go and compete maybe 25, 30 tournaments a year. Wow. A lot. Wow. Wow. Uh, but That's a big trophy. Yeah, and they start their own collection. I've got one student who he's finally retired now, but he's won over 4,000 trophies. Gosh, does he own a house with a big basement to put yeah, him in? It's James, it's James <laughs> Hobby up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh my gosh, that is funny. Yeah, he'd have to have a whole basement to store his trophies in. 4,000 mm -hmm. trophies. Golly doodle. Wow. Do you ever see you not doing this? Well, it's sort of been uh, such a, a part of my life. I was uh, 
had every intention, you know, uh, after college, I became a high school football coach. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, would have stayed in coaching. Uh, I was already involved in karate and had earned my black belt, but um, nobody went out and started teaching karate back then. Yeah. And so, uh, but I was over at Harrelson County and the head coach I was with, which I was really learning a lot from, he was a great, great coach at 45 years old, just up and died. Oh no. And so what we thought we had a chance <laughs> maybe having a state championship team the next year, I stayed on one more year, you know, and it just, I thought, well, I'm gonna go teach karate uh -huh. for a while to, to, uh, till I get over his death. Mm -hmm. But what I found out was that when I started teaching karate, it fulfilled my coaching desires. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't pinned down in a classroom all day long. Right, sounds like more fun to me, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and plus you can let them watch you, learn from you, you can be a great example. And I think that's to me, when I look at the times I spent in school, my favorite teacher was a home ec teacher and she was a great example to me. And I think if you can just set the standard to be a great example to your students. Well, that is so very important now. Um, uh, you know, all martial arts are good. Um, so uh, everyone that's involved in a different type of or different style says theirs is the best, but mm -hmm. all martial arts are good. It's really up to the person. But just uh, in everything we do, you know, I would watch my children, you know, I just wouldn't put them in a, a scout program just for the heck of it. You know, I'd want to investigate it a little right, bit. Right, exactly. And uh, make sure that uh, the leader is Right. That's, that's funny that you said that <clears throat> because I was one of those moms that I had to know, now who is he and where, where is he from and what's he about and da 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 da. And my kids would say, well, he's, don't ask all those questions. Yes, that's what's wrong with America. We, for, we quit asking questions. We need to ask questions of our leaders. We need to ask questions of our teachers. We need to know what is being put into our children's minds. And we forget to do that sometimes. We get busy. No excuse. No excuse. Well, I agree with you. Um, I, w I just wouldn't want to throw my child out there uh, in with any, uh, anyone just teaching or whatever like that. But we, we're a, uh, we're a Christian-leaning organization. Uh, yes, we fight. And some people might say, well, how do you fight? Uh, if violence is not involved in it, it's a beautiful thing. It's an mm -hmm. art. Right. But when somebody loses their temper, right. then it becomes wrong. Right. So that's one of the things we have to teach, you know. And uh, just because somebody punches you in the nose. Or the uh, eye. <laughs> it's, it's not actually their, their fault. It's yours for allowing it. Yeah, yeah. So you have to defend yourself. Yeah. Do you have classes that people try to do this and then they just say, this just isn't for me? How many people can get through it and it is all they want? How many people, what's the dropout rate? Oh, I would say that uh, comparison of, of someone beginning in karate and making black belt, uh, it's quite uh, significant uh, because it takes a long time to make black belt. It took me four mm -hmm. years to make black belt. Wow. And uh, so, each, and you were constant. And you were. Oh yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. These uh, stripes represent long periods of time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, the last stripe I got was uh, it took twelve years wow. to get there. But this is a lifelong endeavor. Right. Like I say, it's an exercise program that happens to be self-defense, uh -huh. and uh, has stretching in it. You have to think in karate. You just don't go out there and and uh, mindless movements or whatever like that. Uh, and so it develops posture. <coughs> and also it helps teach a person to succeed, mm -hmm. you know, because they reach these belt ranks mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And- uh, Don't give up. Don't give up. Um, uh, and that's something that well, as we go on, you know, like I said, we're a little bit softer every year than we were the year before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it has to do, I hate to say it, our parenting skills. I, I laughed because I put something on Facebook. I, I, <coughs> I had my mom on my mind a lot. And my mama used to always 
ask me a question, I'd been in a little trouble or something, something stupid, and she would know the answer. And she'd say, I know the answer before you open your mouth. And I'd look at her and say, then why are you asking me? Because I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me. Parents used to make us accountable. We used mm -hmm. to have to, you know, if your curfew is 11 o'clock, be in the door at 10.59. Now, no such thing. And my mama was an 11 o'clock stickler, and that was that stupid Channel 2 news out of Atlanta. It's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? I remember that. Oh, my Lord. It drove my mother crazy. But I liked that she loved me enough to set standards, to keep up with where I was, to keep up with who I was hanging out with. And, and it was funny because usually the ones that she thought were the troublemakers were the good ones, and the ones that were sugar-coated all da 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 were the troublemakers. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of learn, but your parents need to know who you're hanging out with. Your parents need to know where, what you're doing. And, and when you're doing karate, I, I know, do they start with an orange belt? Seems like I re remember my kids having an orange belt. No, uh, they start at no belt. Okay, because my kids. And then they earn their white belt. Okay. Then they go to orange belt. Okay. Okay, because I can remember when Angela came in with the orange belt and she was excited because she, she had accomplished something she'd never done before. And she was very flexible and she loved it. And she couldn't wait to tell me, and she was all excited. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we got to get to football practice now, you know. And I didn't take much time to appreciate the work that she put into it. Yes, it's a lot of work, you know. And like I say, the flexibility exercises, we have to do a good thorough warm-up and all like that. One of the differences, like I said, uh, you know, about 1.3% of the people in the United States work out. Mm -hmm. that's, that's terrible. Really, it really is terrible. Um, but... The, one of the difference between karate and just like uh, working out in a health spa or whatever like that is that there's only about 10% of the people who are self-starter enough to go into a gym and start working out and then continue on. Mm -hmm. But the difference is in karate, <coughs> you're under instruction the whole time. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not just coming there Free and lights. working out on your own. You're under instruction. So... It's a regimented program that continues on and on and on. I have a friend who's, I'll just say she's younger than me, but she just joined a gym for just a special class. And I said, how's it going? And she said, well, it's wimpy. She said, they're treating us like we're old and they're not challenging us enough. And she said, but my hip hurts today. <laughs> <laughs> so I laughed and I said, well, it's a good thing they're not challenging you much. But, but she's enjoyed doing that. She just signed up for it a few weeks ago, and it's just, I think it's two mornings a week, you know, something like that. But she's enjoyed doing it. So maybe it's time this year, maybe 2024 is the year to encourage people to sign up any kind of program. Now, what's your oldest student now signing up? Who starts karate? What age do they normally start? I had a, a man who has uh, just retired from uh, uh, I think he's from Atlanta and moved up here. Uh -huh. He's a retired attorney, and uh, he is in his late 60s, uh -huh. and he just began a few weeks ago. Wow. So it's, it's really something that everybody can do. The stretching that's uh, involved in karate is excellent for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do your arm around and around like this 100 times every day when you're five years old and you continue to, when you get to be 80 years old, you'll still be able to do it. But when right. you don't, right. it sort of locks down on you. Mm -hmm. So I was a physical education major in college and uh, just always been interested in that aspect of life. And uh, uh, when I found karate, I found a sort of a complete program. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the self-defense part of it was something that was added. I enjoyed the fighting uh, immensely and uh, our school is known for having good competent fighters and uh, we've been all over this country and several places in the world competing. Wow. How many bloody noses have you caused? Caused? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, probably a few but I've also had my own uh, that uh, way several times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unlike me. You're having a bloody nose now. Uh-oh, I'm uh -oh, sorry. Uh-uh, wait a minute. Okay, there you go. Uh-oh. I mentioned it. See? The power of the power of persuasion. <laughs> I'm sure this dry weather and crazy cold is irritating everybody's sinuses. 
So. Yeah, I have a little problem with that. Uh, we burn a lot of wood at our house uh -huh. and everything yeah. that dries yeah. out everything. Yeah, it does. It makes it really, really hard. We're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to give you some more ideas of what you can do. It's 2024. Let's make 2024 that you begin something that you really like. Your youngest student today is how old? Six years old. Six years old. If you have a six-year-old sitting at home who says, I want to, what do you think of the movie Karate Kid? Did you love that movie? Yeah, I thought it was uh, funny in, in a lot of ways because uh, uh, it makes it sound like karate teaches you not to be a bully. Uh -huh. And usually if we have a bully that comes in, they turn out to be some of our better students. Wow. Because they learn, you know, they're not quite as tough as they thought they were. <laughs> I love that. I love that. We're going to take a commercial break. We'll be right back. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ. How may I serve you? The mountains are calling and they're closer than you think. Farmers Crossing and Ball Ground offers creekside lots with homes beginning in the 400s. Walking distance to downtown shopping, dining, tennis courts, Calvin Farmer Park, and local events. It also includes a beautiful hike to Long Swamp Creek. Leave the car and the worries behind. Move in by fall 2023. Call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at 770-733-0779. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. You know, how you feel on the inside yeah. is just as important to me as how you feel on the outside. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> I grown up, grown up, grown up, up in every way, in every way, guarantee you. You're my grown up and I know you're there. I'm your grown up and you know I care. Cause it's you and me and me and, me and, me and you. So when you are okay or not okay, I'll take care of you. in the pool, making a masterpiece, or just making memories, writing a great American novel, or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow. Whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge.
Dell Land here with Ben Cocker, and he's the subject of, um, of our story. And Ben, before we get into all of the great successes that you've had in karate and the successes that United Karate Studio has had, I want to talk about your background growing up here in LJ. And uh, you've always been athletic and been involved in athletics. And uh, growing up, of course, there probably wasn't any karate in LJ. But I wanted to talk to you about how you got involved in sports as a youth here. Well, in going to grammar school, I guess just like everybody, we played uh, softball or at recess or anything like that. Then we started a little junior team when I was in the third grade. And uh, we got to play one ball game a year uh, in football. And it was that way through the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Just had one ball game a year. And uh, uh, then in the eighth grade, uh, we, we uh, played several ball games. We had about seven games that year. We played each grammar school in Murray County. And then we played in what they call the Talc Bowl back then. Our team had beat, we had beaten every one of their grammar schools. And then they all came together and picked their best players out. And, and we played them in the Talc Bowl in the eighth grade. But what got me started, I guess, was uh, I lived on Oak Street up here behind Mr. Pease, and uh, uh, fortunately there were some older boys there on the block, both my brothers and Ronnie Milton and uh, some other guys that were a little older than me that were around that area. And we'd play basketball behind the house or get out there and play football in the street. And uh, uh, all I could think about was that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. The first year, you could tell that Ben had the ability to be a, be a quarterback. I remember when he was a freshman, we was playing this team, had him about 28 to nothing. And they punted to us, and we had the ball on about the 42 yard, our own 42 yard line, and put Ben in. And Ben run a one play, he was, gained about four yards and we was on our own 48 yard line. Ben drops back and threw, the, threw a perfect pass. Guy caught it in stride and scored. Ben stood there and jumped up and down. He was his own cheering section <laughs> till they lined the ball up on the three yard line for the extra point. Ben, as a kid, just as a little kid before he got in high school, was always around there and it was very obvious from uh, the time I first saw him, that he was going to be an exceptional uh, product as far as football or, and sports in general are concerned. Even to this day, uh, uh, Coach Gudger and Coach Sluter and Coach Shotwell uh, still have power over my life, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, they, uh, whatever they said, you know, I just took it as law and that's the way it was. And, uh, uh, they had a tremendous influence over me, uh, even to this day. Uh, I still remember all the plays that we ran in football, everything like that. And uh, uh, Coach Gudger and Coach Sluter, it's remarkable what they did with only two coaches coaching every sport. And uh, uh, they took us and would talk to, well, they talked to me a little bit as we was uh, coming up on the junior team. And uh, I, I don't know, I was just so impressed. I, I thought that's what everybody wanted to do with all their heart. Ben never missed anything. If, if you made a good play, he'd identify him. If you goofed up on a play, he'd slap you on the headgear. They didn't do better than the next time. We had some disappointments and we had some big times. And uh, he's just one of those tremendous athletes and persons that I've ever had a uh, privilege to deal with. He's, he's just a pleasure to be around. What are some of your favorite memories of your teammates? Well, we all grew up together and we were a tight group. I mean, really tight. Um, I've heard teachers say 20 years after we'd gone through school that that was the closest knit class that they'd ever had come through the high school. And uh, we just started playing ball with each other, you know, very young. And uh, uh, with Larry Ellington at fullback and Mickey Call at halfback, and Eddie Stegall at the other halfback, and uh, um, then Tommy Qualls at center, and Henry Mashburn, Larry Ray, and Homer Jackson, uh, Leon Parks. 
and Steve Partridge, who passed away a few years ago. So we were, we were a close, close group, and we'd played together for a long time. He was small as a ninth and tenth grader. In tenth grade, he was number 19. When he tucked his jersey in, the pot bottom part of the number went into his pants. And so we gave him a hard time, and then he hit the growing spurt. And by the time then, as a junior, there were nine of us that started either on offense or defense. And he was, he was the guy. He was the take charge. He was, you know, you've heard that he was the quarterback. Well, he was literally, figuratively, the quarterback. He was the one we all uh, listened to. And, uh, and Mr. I don't know if Mr. Gudger or Mr. Sluter said, but I think sometimes he was making up some of the plays as we went. Uh, we were... I think a lot ahead of our time, we ran a lot of double slots, double wings, uh, called it the old belly series back there, which is a, an option series that a lot of people run these days. And, but, uh, you know, we, we ran basically off, off him and, uh, you know, threw the ball well, just, you know, good athlete. Um, had a lot of success in the traditional ball and stick sports and um, um, and had probably some opportunities I believe to play um, at the at the college level and you ended up in in karate which uh, at that time was sort of an, an unknown or a mystery um, how did you end up in karate well <clears throat> sort of interesting I, like most people in those days karate was something that was very very mysterious uh, we had no knowledge of it. Generally what I thought was that there would be some little Oriental man over there would wave his hand and his opponent would fall down dead. But um, how I got started was that uh, uh, my wife was going to Reinhardt, or my girlfriend was going to Reinhardt College at that time and she started taking karate. And uh, so I was at the University of Georgia and she started telling me about how great it was and uh, what all these guys could do. And I got to thinking, no, I can do that, I can do that. I was at Reinhardt College uh, and I uh, joined the class and I was the only girl. And I told him all of the good looking guys that were in class and so he checked it out I think after that. She had been trained for a pretty good while and then she kept telling me about it, so she invited me to a class, and it was on a Sunday. It was taught by Kimsey Wood. And uh, so I attended that class, and I realized here is something that I can compete in the rest of my life. You know, it's not like where you play high school sports and it's over with, and then you only can play softball or, you know, in those days, JC softball or whatever. And uh, so uh, it just... Uh, was a real honor for me to get to to start taking karate and I was with Vicky too and so we had a good time and uh, then she dropped out later on and and I continued. Vicki, how did you come in contact with uh, Ben? Ben. Um, I was riding a horse in town and uh, this bus, uh, this car load of um, burly football players stopped and uh, they started talking to me. And at that time, I was um, going to Pickens County. I was a cheerleader, and Ben introduced himself as a quarterback of uh, football. Well, our schools are rivals, so it was interesting, but we started dating uh, in high school and went through college and married my last uh, year of college. They have a wonderful marriage, and a marriage that I uh, admire. And she has been very, very supportive to him through the years. Uh, he's had to be gone to a lot of tournaments. Many times she would go and be supportive at the tournament. That's a little tidbit of what there will be more of because we will re-air that whole segment that was done in 2005. And uh, it's amazing to see all that you've done. But what to me is more amazing is that now your schools are growing, growing, growing. 13 schools now? Yes, we have... Uh... Uh, Jim Haymore teaches in Gainesville, Georgia. Brad Boyle teaches in Dahlonega. J. Lynn West teaches in Flowery Branch. Dan Haymore in Blue Ridge. Tommy Qualls till he retired. And then Richard Bruce t 
took over in uh, Jasper, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Tommy Reeves in Calhoun. Tim Marks took my place when I stopped in Dalton there in Dalton. And uh, you said Dalton, you talked 48 years? 48 years, 48 yeah, years. over there. Wow, that's Went across like that mountain. generational. Yeah. Went across yeah. that mountain 48 years. And Jesse wow. Thornton's in Ringo. Uh, Derek Pendergrass is in Chickamauga. Uh, Jane Scott's in uh, Cookville, Tennessee. And uh, Frank Pennington's out there in uh, Keokuk, Iowa. Wow, that is crazy. That is crazy. I yeah. love that it's continuing, and we were talking about the movie, um, The Karate Kid. My kids really liked that movie, and that's pretty much what got them involved in wanting to do karate because they liked the discipline that that gentleman taught. It was just amazing. It was the discipline. Very much so. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You have to be disciplined, uh, and with children... It's a little difficult because they're forced to do these things. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets a little bit hard or something like that, and they say, Mom, this is hard. She says, okay. Okay, sweetie, we're not going to make you do it. Don't do that. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Well, I was laughing about how my mama always knew. Anytime I did anything wrong, mama knew before I got home. The parents know that. But I got kicked out of school one time for smoking. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life except when my mother sat us down because my sister thought it'd be cute to hide Mama's cigarettes, so she put them in her pocketbook. Boy, did we get our butts in trouble. But Mama sat us down and made us smoke a cigarette. And my sister and I, till the day she died, would talk about how we gagged and puked and heaved. We're non-smokers. We could not smoke. So when I got caught in the bathroom with all my friends who smoked, we all got suspended. And Mama went to the school and said, listen, she may do some things. She has skipped fifth period to go shoot pool. I know about that. And I looked at her and said, how did you know about that? <laughs> she said, Mommy, you told me where you got that $20 you had in your pocket. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So, so your, kids, your kids want you to be involved in their life, and they want you to ask questions. And, and sometimes we drop the ball and we forget. And I told you I wasn't even there when Angela excelled as she excelled in karate and she loved doing it. She really enjoyed it. Yeah, the uh, people don't understand. You need some kind of exercise program for life. And I think this, again, is one of the things that we fail to do. And, uh, karate is a great exercise. In the Orient, they understand that a little bit more. You know, they had their home dojos. Mm -hmm. uh, but Oftentimes, you know, when the sweat starts coming down, you know, and the little kid says, Mama, this is hard. And it's okay, you don't have to go tomorrow. Bless your heart. But uh, yeah, yeah. the parents that are strong continue on, continue on, because they realize what it's going to uh -huh. do for them. And you said they do it about three days a week, is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. That's a big commitment during a school year and, and with all the other activities and homework and everything. That's a big commitment. Well, when I'll go into a fight, I want to be prepared. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, how much time is it? Is it an hour class? How long does it last? Yeah, the children's classes are generally one hour, mm -hmm. and uh, then sometimes we have special classes on Saturday, uh, which is just like maybe solid sparring, you know, for mm -hmm. every how long we go. Mm -hmm. And if they want to call and set up, is it, do you do a trial period to see if they're going to work? Do they, what's the commitment they make just to go in the studio and get started? Uh, good question there. And this is, you know, karate is not for everyone, but uh, a person that wants to work out and keep, stay healthy, it's a good program. Uh, we have a two-week introductory course. Mm -hmm. uh, they come in, they train with us for uh, two weeks. It's for them to find out if they like it and want to do it. And it also gives us a chance to study them to see which course is best for them. Uh -huh. Uh, the cost of it is $30, but we have a special going on that also includes their uniform. Uh -huh. Wow. And what do you call this? This in, uh, in Japanese is called a gi. In Korean it's called dobok. And how many years have you been wearing one of those? Over 50? About, about uh, 55 years, something wow. like that. Wow, isn't that crazy? Yeah, uh, but it's something that I fell in love with right off the bat, um, and I like to see people reach goals and advance. Uh -huh. And 
quite frankly now, um, United Karate Studios as a whole, we've produced over a thousand black belts. That's awesome. That's awesome. And some world champions. Yes, Robert Harris was uh, a world champion. And one other, uh, one other thing, uh, Deborah Nichols, uh, she became a professional world boxing champion. Isn't that crazy? So yeah. we went off into that, yeah. you know, from karate, and she became world champion. That is, what an opportunity. What an amazing opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. was good. And when you look back at your career and your life, are you the oldest studio in the state of Georgia? Yes, LJ is the oldest oldest school that's still operating in the state of Georgia, as far as my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Joe Corley's in Atlanta was until he retired about uh, eight or nine years ago. Now, is there anybody when Ben Kiker decides, when Vicky says, "I want to retire," and you finally go, "Okay, who's going to take over?" We have. Uh, you know, it has to go a little bit by rank, mm -hmm. and uh, we have some capable people that uh, uh, whenever I kick the bucket or whatever <laughs> it is, they'll be ready to go. Karate kicking the bucket. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Well, you know, I, I look at what you've done for other people, and, and you love sharing what they've done and what they've accomplished, and uh, congratulations to you on, on a... A huge win for you as being the top school. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool for the last 40 years. And again, there's his, there's his to prove it. And uh, that's what it's about. Set a goal, reach the goal, and then go past the goal. Continue on. Now. Yeah, yeah. You've got to exercise all of your life. Mm -hmm. All of your life. And the thing about karate is you have to think uh -huh. And it's also involves strength and a lot of flexibility. Uh -huh. And and that it's so funny because I I can see my child. She could do a split like you've never seen, and she could lay all the way down on the floor in full split position. And it hurt me to watch it. And I was going, "What?" <laughs> no. yeah. But she took pride in that. Yeah. Well. That's a gift if you've got it. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't have no, that. No, no. Uh, Her it, mama don't. <laughs> it's, it's pretty yeah. rare. But uh, you can increase your flexibility by, by stretching. And uh, that just makes you be able to maneuver in life a lot better, you know. Uh, uh, exercising, exercising, exercising. And, you know, it's there. You come and train for an hour, and then you go home, and you forget yeah. about it till the next time. Yeah. Let me ask you this. When you do your two-week program, do most people get really sore during that two-week period as they're getting their body used to doing stuff? Uh, a little bit when they're uh, never stretched before, and, mm -hmm. and the, they start off, we do some simple stretching with them, not in-depth or anything mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that, because it takes a while to get your muscles uh ready to stretch hard mm -hmm. and uh, you've got to uh, uh, approach that correctly because uh, you don't want to pull a hamstring. No, you don't. Oh, no. Well, you know what we've got to do? We've got to get out of here because this hour just flew by and you're going to have to come back and see me again. Next time, will you bring some students? Yes, ma'am. And I let's sure do will. a demonstration. Can we do that? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to nail you down on that one. We're going to do it. Have a great day today, y'all. Stay warm. Stay in the house if you can and do something for somebody else, even if it's just picking up the phone and calling and saying, howdy, I was thinking about you. I'll see y'all again soon on ETC, and here we go to YouTube. Bye, y'all.